Hi all, uh, welcome uh, back to the next bit of the conference uh, on stage three. Um, hoping that you have enjoyed it so far. I certainly have. Um, I've done a bit of uh, some of the, one of the CTFs, uh, went on to the uh, mental health hackers uh, little booth. I looked at all the other booths that, that are there. Um, it's been a really good conference and I hope everyone's enjoying it. And yeah, if, if you if you have some time, go and try all the different things. Uh, there's certainly a lot of stuff to do, a lot of content. Um, and but yeah, I thank you very much for, for taking some time off to to come and you know spend time with us and uh, with this talk uh, specifically. Um, Th thank you very much. Now, before we begin, let me just uh, thank our sponsors, uh, uh, starting with uh, eLearn uh, Security and Ex Axonius. So Axonius, they do asset tracking, which is very important because uh, you can't secure something if you don't know it exists. So um, they'll help you out with that, uh, managing your assets. And then eLearn Security, which is now running on INE's platform. Uh, they have a free tier, so you can actually get started with them for free. Uh, see if you enjoy what what they what they offer. Um, if you don't, you don't, and if you do, then yeah, you're welcome to to continue with them. Um, so this conference would not be as professional or as big or as nice without without uh, you know the support of all the sponsors. And you, yeah, very much recommend to re recommended to check them all out and see what they're about. Um, and yeah, um, so they also have virtual booths, so you can go have a look at their virtual booths um, and see what they're about. But I'll go do that right now because now we have a, a, an amazing talk um, by uh, Kathy Gellis, who is a cyber lawyer uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area and a contributor to TechDirt. Uh, Kathy works a lot with online speech and platforms. And the talk today is section 230, uh, the law that everyone loves to hate and what it means to you. I'm really excited to see this because I've heard a lot about section 2 230 recently. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and I, I love the law. It always impacts on, on information security in the most interesting ways. Um, so yeah, without any more ado, uh, Kathy, take it away. Great. Thanks, Alan. And thanks to the Diana Initiative for having me. Um, I am here to talk to you about one of the hottest topics these days, Section 230. And as Alan said, I'm a lawyer. And one of the things I do in my practice as a lawyer is defend Section 230. And I do this because what I'm really trying to do is defend speech. And to have speech online means that we have to defend the platforms that facilitate it. And as I'll explain in the talk, that means we have to have Section 230. Um, I've given a variation of this talk a few times before, and in one of them I use the idea of online cat pictures as a type of online speech we can easily get our head around it. Because where do we get all our cat pictures on the internet, the internet obviously being made of cats? It's all the people who use the internet who provide all this content and make the internet this rich place that it is. Um, this is what we call user-generated content, and this is what Section 230 exists to facilitate because if we didn't have Section 230 to enable the platforms to exist, we wouldn't be able to get the user-generated content and the internet and its supply of cat pictures would all be corporate and we'd have nothing but Disney cats and that would be sad. So I am going to explain what Section 30 does, why it's good, why we shouldn't mess with it, and try to frame the, the big picture. So, before I go into it, and I'm gonna give you a scenic tour of the statute, but don't be afraid, it's a readable statute and I'm here to help translate, it'll be fine. Um, I wanna point out some overarching principles to think about in the back of your mind that when I tell the statutory story, this is why the language in it is important and this is the job that it's doing. So one big thing like overarching principles, when you hear people complain about section 230, they're not really complaining about Section 230. They're complaining about the internet um, because let's face it, there's some crap on the internet, some bad things happen on the internet, there's some bad people on the internet and some of them say and do bad things and that's a problem and we legitimately can get upset by that. But it also may be not Section 230 that's creating the environment where that stuff 
it, and some of it is the First Amendment because we protect free speech very broadly in the United States because it's only by protecting it broadly that we protect it for the good speech. But it means we also have, you know, if people can speak, if we try to keep it that nobody could ever say and say or do anything bad, um, we would also accidentally take out people's ability to say or do anything good, and that would be a problem. So some of what we actually have here is not even Section 230 operating on the internet itself. It's that the things that people are complaining about, the First Amendment would have protected somebody in this picture entirely. So even if you got rid of Section 230, you wouldn't change the thing that you're upset about. Okay. But the reason why Section 230 is important is because litigation can be cripplingly expensive. Even when you might win, it can be devastating to have to go through the process of defending your position. So even to the extent that a platform may have its own First Amendment rights, for instance, in choosing what content to facilitate and have on its systems, that's all well and good that it has the First Amendment right to do it, but it also needs some protection so it doesn't get obliterated by lawsuits along the way in order to exercise this First Amendment right. The point of Section 230 is to make sure that the systems that we depend on in order to have the internet can exist without being obliterated from potential liability for how users use their system. Because if we think about the amount of content that's actually going up, Think about like, how many tweets are happening per hour, day, minute. It, how could somebody who's offering a service like that possibly keep track and police everything that's ending up on their systems? It wouldn't be possible. And if they were in a position where they might get legally you know, or financially obliterated if they let something troubling through, who could be in the business of, of offering these services? The reality is that the internet works by essentially being a system of helpers. For people to be able to speak online, they need systems that can help them speak online. And Section 230 is all about protecting those helpers and making it legally and financially practical for them to exist so they don't have to worry about getting in trouble for the help that they offer. Put another way, the overall goal is Section 230 is to ensure that we get the most good stuff online as well as the least bad. It puts the helpers the platforms, the service providers in a position where they can do the best we can they can to help us get the most good stuff and the least bad because they're not going to get in trouble and obliterate it if they do it wrong. So it gives them the incentive to try to get it right. Something to think about also is effective regulation doesn't always need to be punitive. We tend to think about law as a thou shalt not do X and you, you're punished and bad and sent to your room uh, without dessert if you do the bad thing. But sometimes there's other ways of doing it. Um, carrots work. What I just said in that, with that earlier slide, what would Congress want the most good stuff and the least bad stuff online? What would align the interests of the platform so that they can be partners with Congress to help make sure we get that? And so Section 230 essentially is a system of carrots rather than sticks. Because instead of saying you're in trouble if you get it wrong, it says you're safe if you get it wrong. So it means that the platforms can do the best they can to try to get it right. The other thing is we're never going to get this completely right. I mean, even if 0.00001% of the internet is crap and the rest of it's good, the problem is, is 0.001% of the internet is an awful lot of speech and some very conspicuous examples of really terrible stuff. And that's hard to look at and shrug our shoulders and pretend we're okay with. But we don't want to lose the 99.99999% of the good stuff. So what we need is a system that gets as close to that optimum balance as we can. Um, the most good stuff we can possibly can and the least bad stuff that we can possibly get. Section 230 gives us a chance to get as close to that goal as possible. So let's talk a little bit about the history of where we got Section 230. Um, I have thrown into this slide um, the First Amendment. Um, it is speaking to a lot of what is going on with a lot of these online policies. Um, and that's obviously goes back quite a few years um, to came along with the Constitution as part of its original ratification. Then move ahead 200 years or so. And we come to the mid 90s when the internet stopped being 
just defense and academic thing and started to reach the public conscious consciousness. And that also created the alarm that people were using it for porn. Um, there was a lot of moral panic, panic about all the porn that may be online. And let's face it, early adopters of communications technologies often are some of the more adult types of communication. So Senator Exxon and some of his other colleagues were really, really worried about that. And they were thinking about passing a law to ban the porn online. Meanwhile, there was also a lawsuit about um, a, an existing service provider at the time called Prodigy. Um, I can't see a show of hands for how many of you remember Prodigy, but it was originally sort of a dial-up bulletin board service where um, they were online communities. It was not necessarily the internet, although eventually it got connected up to the internet, but it was Prodigy, America Online, CompuServe. Um, this was sort of our early understanding of a commercially available internet. And they got sued for content that somebody had posted on their systems. And there were a couple of congressmen who were not happy with, well, it wasn't just that they got sued, but there was a state court judge in New York who basically said, hold you liable for something your user said? Yeah, that sounds good. Let's let this lawsuit go ahead. And they were really alarmed with it, partly for two reasons. If the platform could get in trouble for the stupid things that its users may have been saying, Going back to like that Twitter example, how could they possibly allow all the speech we wanted to facilitate online if they could end up in trouble for it? This is not good. They, we wanted to make sure that we had service providers to make sure people could speak online, but that's a huge disincentive for anybody to go to not go into that business because if you go into that business and the law runs through, you're in trouble. It might be game over. There was also a second problem, which is Prodigy was trying to actually run sort of curated community and they were advertising, you know, we try to clean stuff up and get rid of the bad stuff. And the judge had used that advertisement and held it against them. It was, it was sort of like, if you didn't know the crap was there, maybe you wouldn't be in trouble for it. Because you tried to know what, what crap was on your system and you got it wrong, that's why we're going to hold you liable. And that was the theory of liability. And the congressmen were like, well, this is no good. The internet is coming. People are using it. And some of them are using it in bad ways. We need to make sure that the platforms can be in a position to help us get rid of the bad stuff, as well as be available to help us get the good stuff. Anyway, these two things collided, uh, the outrage against the porn and the concern about this case, and it formed the Communications Decency Act. Then there was litigation challenging the Communications Decency Act because trying to ban the porn is not a particularly constitutional thing under the First Amendment. So we had a case called Reno versus ACLU, which had the effect of striking down most of the Communications Decency Act because it's not consistent with the First Amendment. Um, but what got left standing was Section 230 that had got gotten bolted onto it as part of the reaction to the Strata Oakmont case. So. Here we are, Section 230 now exists. All right, so we're going into our scenic tour here. Uh, don't panic, this is all readable, I'll explain. Uh, but one thing I wanted to flag is, people keep talking about how Section 230 is a gift to big tech. And you will notice in all the statutory text, including the bits that I'm not even showing you, nowhere does the word big tech show up. And that's important. This is a very broad, agnostically drafted statute, and that's part of its power, and that's something that we mess with at, at our peril at this point. All right, so the statute opens up with subsection A and subsection B, and I'm just going to scroll through these words really quickly, because um, what they basically amount to is Congress declaring that it has found that the internet is a pretty cool thing, and it is the policy of the United States to keep it the cool thing. Um, but they were also worried about the hygiene of online to wanting to make sure that like the bad stuff could be minimized. And so you have this sort of preamble type text at the beginning of Section 230 announcing that the rest of Section 230 is in furtherance of that goal that I had basically already told you. It boils down to we want the most good stuff online and the least bad stuff online. And everything that Section 230's key language does is designed to make sure we can achieve both goals as best as we can. All right, this is the core section of Section 230. I'll leave it up there. Um, I have tried to read it aloud at talks before, but I, 
it really sounds ugly when I just try to pronounce it. So go ahead and, and take a moment to read it. Um, it has been called the 26 words that has created the internet. Um, well, I'll read it anyway. No provider of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. And I highlighted those two terms because they are the key bits. And the key bits are defined over here. So let's drop down to the bottom one first. The information content provider, this is who wrote the content, created the content, uh, imbued the content with its potentially wrongful character. Um, whoever wrote this, communicated it, expressed it, what that statute said in those 26 words is, okay, it didn't change the fact that those people are still going to be responsible for what they put online. What it did say is that, that bit in number two, the interactive computer service, the platform, the facilitator, the helper who facilitated that expression from the information content provider, they are not going to be held liable for it. Um, this basically means you hold the creator responsible, but not the facilitator responsible. And this is the key and the power of Section 230 that has allowed all these services, you know, over 20 plus years to come up, rise up. We have an internet economy, exchange of information. Everything good about the internet has been facilitated and enabled because we have this basic framework built into Section 230. There is, actually, I want to make this point. Just going to go back a slide. So, interactive computer service. Remember, I said that um, you don't see big tech in there. It just kind of describes that it's providing a service. Sometimes I call it a platform. Sometimes I call it, you know, an ISP or something like that. But it's kind of broad in terms of who it applies to. And yeah, okay, it's going to cover quote unquote big tech. It's going to cover our social media platforms in some ways that it's pretty easy to kind of see how that would work. Like Twitter is full of tweets, which are user generated content. Twitter's not writing the tweets, the users are. Um, it covers things like consumer reviews sites. It covers e-commerce platforms, although there's some litigation these days challenging to what extent it does, but it does, it does. If you read the statute, it should protect e-commerce platforms and there's case law that says that it does comment sections on online newspapers, search engines, because what is a search engine doing but listing content that somebody else created, payment providers who are facilitating things that somebody else provided, email providers, ISPs, including broadband providers, backend services, traditional bulletin boards, and you, individuals. This is one of the things that frustrates me with all the, the big tech hate. That, and people are like, oh, I don't like the big tech, so let's get rid of Section 230. It doesn't have any criteria for how big the platform needs to be. It can be a Google or Facebook, but it can also be a Wikimedia, which is nonprofit, and it can be an individual blog that takes comments. It can be your own Facebook pages where you have comments on your posts. And it basically means that if somebody comes onto your Facebook page and writes something in one of your comments that's terrible, um, you're not liable for the crap that they just put on as a comment on your post. Um, same as if you deleted it because it was ugly, they can't sue you for having deleted it either because it gives you protection in both ways, just as it gives a bigger corporate player protection for leaving stuff up and taking stuff down. There is this complementary provision at C2. The, the big one was at subsection C1. C2 speaks a little bit more directly to that bit about taking stuff down um, and the moderation of faculty that platforms often have. Um, what's interesting is as the law has been on the books, C1 actually has had the effect of providing the protection for moderating behavior. Um, but there's a lot of, you'll hear people squealing when they don't like Section 230, especially when they don't like the moderation that platforms are doing. They'll squeal about C2 and what they're they tend to hone in on and I highlight it is the bit about or otherwise objectionable because what that basically means is it, it gives a big broad brush for yeah you can take stuff down for pretty much any reason that you would think it's um, is necessary and if you go back and think of the example of your own Facebook post of somebody's posted a comment on your site and you don't like it you know 
you would feel weird if you couldn't take it down without creating liability. If somebody come and posted an ugly comment on a picture of your kid, like, you know, you wouldn't want to like have some law pressure you or the potential high legal stakes driving your decision of whether you had you could take it down or not. So there's a broad brush built into the statute, although some of it is not just this section, it's the other one that we looked at earlier. So we're kind of at a midpoint. Um, so I wanna highlight some of the other things built into the statute because that also drives some of the policy and how well it works or in some instances, how well it doesn't work. And here is a kid in picture because I think you, you've earned one, here you go. All right, so they put into section 230 at the outset, a couple of like asterisk type sections. Um, one of the things was there was some concern that section 230 might interact with another law called ECPA and they didn't know how it would interact. So they basically wrote a provision that said, don't worry about it. They don't mess with each other. No issues here. And as far as I know, there really hasn't been any litigation about this in 20 years. So they stuck it in, it's in the statute. It's part of your scenic tour, but let's ignore it because it hasn't been that important. This bit has been important. Um, this is what's called a preemption provision. And a preemption provision basically says, um, uh, it means that the states don't get to mess with this. In fact, that's pretty much what that provision actually literally says, the states don't get to mess with it. Because if you think about the internet, um, you know, if you have a, I mean, I'm sitting in one state right now talking to you and I have no idea where you are, but you're not here, you're somewhere else and you're probably in another state. So this is crossing state lines, even though right now I'm doing all my expression currently in this one particular state and maybe governed by this particular state's laws. Um, you know, this is an interstate business and we can't have each individual state come up with its own rules of the road because how would we function? Like, I don't know if what I'm saying might be illegal in your state where you're sitting. Um, I, you know, would this platform get in trouble? They don't, you know, how to deal with different rules that may be in conflict with each other. Um, so Congress basically said, get out of this business. If it comes to regulating the internet so we get the most good stuff and the least bad stuff, online, this is our job, and you don't get to create your own state law that changes that policy balance as we've achieved it. This is important, but you'll start to see in some of the latest news as people you know, get cranky and start to challenge Section 230 that some of the states kind of are trying to change and create their own local rules of the road, but you also see some of the problems when they do. Because if you think about our current political alignment and you think about the rules of the road that a Florida or a Texas keeps trying to impose on the internet and compare them with the types of rules of the road that a California or New York is going to prefer, I think the conflicts start to become apparent, like you couldn't please everybody. And so that's why it's a mistake for any of the states to try. This is a key carve out. So section 230 basically means that whoever gave the content in question its allegedly wrongful quality is responsible for it in any number of ways that the content could be wrongful because the statute isn't specific. But here's a way that it does get specific. This section basically means if the thing that is arguably wrong with the content is that it violates, an or let's just summarize it as it violates an intellectual property right, then section 230 is of no use to the platform whatsoever. Um, now, to some extent, well actually, so what does this mean? Functionally for us, this generally means that it might be infringing a copyright because that's the thing that we all hear about all the time. So what happens if that, if that happens? Well, we go to, the good news for platforms is they still get some protection, not from Section 230, which gives a pretty robust immunity, but instead they go to um, Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and that provides a system of safe harbors. Now, I put this slide in knowing you're not going to be able to read it because this is a bit of language articulating how the safe harbors work. And the problem is, it's complicated, unclear, conditional, and what starts to happen is platforms end up obliterated just trying to litigate whether the safe harbor applied to them in the first place. At which point, it's of no use whatsoever because if you have to endure the lawsuit, you might as well have just been arguing on the merits. You're gonna get bled dry from lawyer fees, and I say this with all apologies, I am a lawyer. Um, and by the way, I am a lawyer, not your lawyer. None of this should be taken as legal advice, but um, you, 
this is not good. Um, I mean, better to have the safe harbor system than no safe harbor system, but it's very, very conditional, not particularly useful, and doesn't really give platforms much protection. And the consequence of that is that the internet keeps becoming Swiss cheese because you keep going like to YouTube and you see all the, you know, this video is not available thanks to a copyright claim. And that's because the platforms are in a position that if somebody sends the takedown notice, it is a not particularly viable to look and see whether, um, you know, try to evaluate whether it's a legitimate takedown notice or not. Um, even if they could catch it, given the huge volume, they're not necessarily going to know because they're not going to have the information to know who's the copyright owner, who's the licensee, is there for use or anything like that. So it's not a particularly, they can't police it effectively and they can't evaluate the takedown notices for whether they're bogus or not. Um, and if they get it wrong or they ignore one because they think it might not be legitimate, they may lose their safe harbor entirely and end up in all sorts of trouble where even if they're exonerated at the end, they're going to be spending a ton of money on lawyers um, and they may get obliterated in the process. And I want to just mention a case called um, Shelter Capital versus UMG. Actually, it's the other way around, UMG versus Shelter Capital. And this was about um, a video hosting service called Veo Networks, which at the time was a competitor to YouTube that ended up getting challenged for whether it had a valid claim to the safe harbor. And in the process of litigating to find out that ultimately, yes, it indeed was protected by the safe harbor and could not be held liable for their users alleged infringement, they went bankrupt. So they don't exist. And now we're a little bit upset that YouTube doesn't have enough competitors. But one of the reasons it doesn't have enough competitors is because we obliterated earlier competitors and made sure that it couldn't grow and exist and be present in, in the present as another potential platform and alternative to YouTube. So better to have the DMCA than not, but it's not as good as Section 230 working on its own. Another key carve out is um, if the thing wrong with the content is that it violated federal criminal law, then also no Section 230 would apply. Um, and this um, this basically covers like the the ugliest of the sex crime things that happened. It covered the child porn and um, it covered a lot of the sexual exploitation um, even of other people. So we already had something that if the thing that was wrong with the content is it may have federal criminal liability, Section 230 also wasn't useful. And that meant that the platforms kind of had to do what they could to police the content, but it gave them a very specific focus look for this really heinous stuff where real people are getting hurt. And, um, you know, you can spend your policing energy on that and focus on it and do a better job because we're not making you have to worry about all sorts of other things that could potentially be wrong with the content. But then some people decided that wasn't good enough. And they, a couple years ago, passed a law that is sometimes referred to as SESTA, but more frequently called FOSTA. Just go with FOSTA. The way the sausage got made, that was the name that ended up uh, finally lasting. And they decided they wanted to go after speech related to sex trafficking more specifically. So if the, in theory, if the thing that was wrong with the user-generated content was that it was in furtherance of the sex trafficking, again, Section 230 wouldn't apply. But the problem is, well, there's a number of problems with this. One of the things is that um, I have it on the screen and I know I told you, don't be afraid of the legalese. Be afraid of this particular legalese. I'm afraid of this legalese and I, in theory, can read it. It's not very readable to understand exactly what, um, where the liability falls and what the platforms need to do or not do. Um, and the problem with it being that unclear is it's led to a whole bunch of platforms getting out of the speech facilitation business. So Craigslist, for instance, took down its online personals. I mean, online personals have been up since the beginning. People have met, married, had kids and happy lives through the, through the internet, through online, through Craigslist online personals. And Craigslist is like, this has got some adult stuff and adults being adults with each other. And that may create liability for us under this and we can't be sure, so we just can't the chance. And so it took off this whole swath of legal speech from the internet because we've now gutted the liability provisions that Section 230 had. And we gutted them in a way that doesn't just create the risk of civil liability, but also potentially criminal. 
The other thing is that even for sex workers who arguably, you know, applying their trade may be illegal under whatever local jurisdiction they're acting, it meant that the providers who they were depending on to ply their trade safely so that they could screen their potential customers, for instance, and turn down the ones who were making them uncomfortable, those platforms went away. They went away because they're like, well, this seems to put us in the crosshairs of a lot of trouble. And I'm sorry, we just can't facilitate, you know, and provide you the tools so you can apply your trade safely. So that drove sex workers into the streets where they are dying. This FOSTA has a body count literally because it's taken away these online services who help them express themselves in the way they needed to express themselves. We took it away. We ruined lawful speech and we drove people into a dangerous world that the internet was no longer giving them the tools that they could make safer for themselves. So those are the big things to point out in the statute. And I'm going to wrap up with some closing thoughts and then open it up for questions. And if nobody has questions, I will toss out a couple other ideas. Um, ideas to hold on to. We talked about it a couple times. Remember how cripplingly expensive a lawsuit is. If you need to call the lawyer to find out what to do with this letter, you're probably running four digits. If he actually needs to do something about it, now you're in five digits. And if you're going to court, you're into six and seven digits, potentially. So, you know, if you think about how many things can go wrong, given the amount of user generated content you're facilitating, that's not controllable. That's not something you can budget. And it, it can make going into these businesses of providing online services, which are generally a good thing. In many ways, they are a good thing. Um, and we were trying to have when we passed Section 230, it makes it a non-viable business. Um, second, uh, remember that Section 230 doesn't really do more than the First Amendment would. It just makes that bundle of expressive associative rights meaningful. No point being, you know, having the rights on your side if you still have to go to court and get blood dry and legal costs to try to defend them. I mean, there is a point, but at scale, this is not going to be a viable business model. Um, remember again, the goal is to have the most good stuff online and the least bad. Any policy needs to optimize for both and shooting for only one tends to compromise the other. So sometimes people will argue, well, we only want to put more pressure on what should be moderated. We're not going to create liability if you host the thing in the first place. It doesn't really have that practical effect. If you're sort of putting legal pressure on a platform or co-opted resources, which no matter how rich it is, it's still inherently scarce. Like there's only so much in that kitty. Um, you are helping them to make decisions that are not going to be conducive to the, well, you want to be have them be as available to users as possible. You want them to invest in their UI. You want them to, um, you know, make sure their uptime is better. Like you are to spend their money for them and the result isn't good, even if you were only focusing on one part of the equation. Another thing, the second bullet, remember that we won't all agree on what counts as the good stuff and what counts as the bad. And the First Amendment tells us we don't have to, and that is not good to have law that tries to pressure us to. We can see that with all the people who are screaming at each other. People on the right are screaming about exactly the opposite things that people on the left are screaming about. This is ir irreconcilable. And if we have law that is trying to force platforms into impossible, to somehow mediate these impossible um, paradoxes, it's not going to work. And the First Amendment is basically exists to get the government and law out of the business of pressuring those decisions. Again, regulating via carrots um, is, is a viable option and much more effective than if we regulated by sticks. Um, we want the most effective thing. Um, we want to make it that platforms can do the best that they can, that we've not spent their resources in ways that may not be conducive for what their users really truly need, what the internet at large truly needs. And um, uh, yeah, let's not do that. Um, and I want to add one other thing, just because um, it's come up in some other talks. It isn't to say that we don't have problems with lots of content out there on the internet. What I was starting to say is, the issue is the role that the state can or should have in trying to solve them, especially in light of the First Amendment and its importance to upholding democratic principles. When people can control the speech, they can control criticism. And you know, I'm, we need to give the platforms the space and the freedom to do the best that they can, to build the best communities they can, to foster the most diverse ideas they can, and innovate the solutions to the problems that we're 
complaining about today. If we take away that freedom, we won't get the solutions. We'll just bake in the problems and create some more. So that is the reason that Section 230 is lovely and wonderful, and we should not mess with it at all, um, except for perhaps like getting rid of the IP exemption and rolling back FOSTA. So with that, I will escape so I can see people again and say goodbye to the kitty, and here we go. So, uh, are you there, Alan? I am, yes. Okay. Can you see me? I am pressing buttons and um okay i found a button i can see me i can see you okay right. perfect okay there we go okay so where are we so um okay so we got one comment uh just about foster just saying that the uh, agreeing with 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 yeah what you said is is the negative impact on this on the safety of sex workers uh is incredibly frustrating um then we also got a uh, earlier question from, from Megan. Uh, do you think that Section 230 addresses the issue of hostile or hate speech or medical disinformation being amplified by platform algorithms? Um, is there a better way that those uh, problems could be addressed? So this gets back to the idea that Section 230 works in a way that is somewhat counterintuitive to us because we're used to punitive based laws of thou shalt not. But you really can't do that in the speech space because the First Amendment says that Congress cannot make laws about thou shalt not when it comes to expression. So what we need is essentially to make sure that the platforms are in a world where there's other sorts of pressures that will help drive the healthiest decisions that they can make. And we already have that world. Um, we just don't always think we do. Um, to be a little glib, it's sort of the marketplace of ideas um, notion, but it's also kind of platforms do have a vested interest in not pissing off their users because they would like to actually continue to have users because if they don't have users, they're not going to have a business. Now, sometimes we look at these platforms and get frustrated because it doesn't look like they're being adequately responsive to these pressures and maybe are taking their users for granted. And I think two things are occurring. One is they are being glib sometimes. I mean, I'm a defender of the internet. I'm a defender of platforms, but I facepalm constantly like Facebook. What? I don't even, you know, there's a lot of criticism that they are fairly due. On the other hand, sometimes they are in positions that are a lot more nuanced and complex with competing pressures, including even expressive type pressures that are driving their decisions and forcing their hands in certain ways. Um, I mean, I have some colleagues who talk about how content moderation at scale is really impossible. Even the most well-meaning platform that really wants to cultivate their, their online community as effectively as they can are going to run into situations that particularly when these moderation decisions are happening at speed and at scale, they're going to get stuff wrong. And it kind of sucks when they get it wrong, but it is very difficult to handle the volume on the internet and not get it wrong at all. What we can basically do is kind of like try to gently, what is it going to take for them to get it right most often? And I put to you, this is section 230, because it takes away the punitive things that would skew their decisions so they can afford to do the best they can or piss off their users at their peril. The other thing is, so some people will say, well, they're too big and they don't have effective competition. All right, there's a lot wrapped up into that idea, some of which I'm gonna kick the can on. But if you think they are too big and powerful and you don't like this one, make sure you can get another one. So I talk about the story of, show, of Veo Networks getting obliterated and now we don't have a competitor to YouTube to do user hosted videos better than YouTube does. Well, it might have been nice if we'd actually made sure that a startup could launch, start, and continue to exist. So it could be an alternative and make alternative choices. So if YouTube's getting it wrong, that's okay because we don't have to go to YouTube anymore. We can go to www.notyoutube.com and host our videos over there because they're doing a better job. Um, the more we think that there's too much entrenchment, the more important it is to make sure we have the legal ecosystem that will allow other services and com competition to come to bear where um, you know, 
you know, we don't have to worry about so much. It, it won't matter so much if YouTube is getting it wrong because somebody else might be able to just to get it right. Okay. Um, all right. So there's another question from Suzette. Um, uh, how is uh, a platform's use of protection from 230 potentially impacted if they are directed by federal level institutions to remove posts or users from multiple outlets? Um, so I guess uh, federal level institutions jumping in and fiddling um, <laughs> on the platforms. I'm gonna presume, I didn't fully understand the question and it's also a little obliterated for me, but um, uh, one of the latest ideas getting pushed around is that the moderation decisions, so a platform has the first amendment right to moderate how it sees fit. And I explained mm -hmm. like, vis-a-vis -vis your own Facebook posts, why that would be so and why that might seem right if you go from like the small scale to, well, you know, Facebook is just a lot of individual people that like it's a larger platform. Um, it, they can make those decisions freely and there should, Section 230 and the First Amendment say there's no liability for how they make it. And even people who get upset that their stuff or themselves and their entire accounts got taken down, I mean, sometimes maybe it's a bad decision worth criticism, but it isn't a, a question of law. It, there's not, a, they're not legally, the platforms are not legally liable for making those decisions. They have the right to be arbitrary and stupid about these decisions if they want. And, you know, other pressures say be less stupid, but legally they're fine. The problem then comes up of what if it's not really their own decisions? And what if there's other forms of pressure that are driving the decisions? And these are the things that we're starting to play with. Now, what I don't like is that a lot of the discourse is just not clued in enough. Like a lot of people are like, state action here, state action there. And it's like, no, that, that's not what's going on. But, you know, then we're getting things like the most recent thing was like um, President Biden's administration pointing out things that didn't look so good on Facebook. Now, I think in that particular instance, it was okay because sometimes what the platforms will do is they want to make good, they want to exercise their right to make moderation decisions in the way that is as good as possible. And they'll look to various authorities to help inform them what is good. And some of those authorities are there's expertise in the federal government and they want to plug into that expertise. It is their choice to plug into that expertise. They can choose to accept it, they can choose to reject it, but that is their choice. So the mere fact that the federal government is then providing that expertise to them doesn't make it state action. But what people were concerned about is, is this an offer they could really refuse? Like, yeah, nice, nice uh, information you got going there. And like, you know, if they can reject the Biden administration's suggestions at no peril to themselves, no state action. The problem is, is there's a lot of enforcement stuff going on, particularly like antitrust that's hitting the big platforms at the same time that they're also sending suggestions for things that maybe should stay up and should stay down. or, And that's putting the platforms in a slightly uncomfortable position. Mm -hmm. If they can freely say no at no peril to themselves, it's not state action when Biden like, you know, gives his top 10 favorite Facebook posts, not an issue. Yep. The question is whether that's really the case or not. And I don't know, entirely know how to answer it. I tend to give that particular announcement a little bit more leeway, but I don't always see enough understanding of how this entire balanced ecosystem works, even coming out of the government. Um, Congress, it's their bill, it's their law, and they don't understand how it works. <laughs> the federal government you know, are is enforcing around reactionary outrage without really understanding the mechanics of what do you want more of? And then how do you incentivize to get more of it? But how do you also make make sure that you don't, you know, kill your golden goose or accidentally create an ecosystem that is going to force more of what you hate? And most of the reform proposals and the outrage and the reactionary things I see from both parties doesn't understand enough of the history and the mechanics and the realities of what it would take to actually provide a platform that facilitates user speech. They get it wrong. And um so their fixes aren't fixes. Even their reform ideas tend to be, you've just gutted it because now you've exposed the platform to unlimited litigation and that's gonna, that's gonna leave a mark. 
So I'm, I'm going to jump back in to uh, uh, Megan's Megan's question because she, she mentioned um, algorithm and that that is something that that I was wondering about. So. Um, the, the, the idea in my mind that uh, of 230 is, is that um, the, the way it was described to me originally is, is that uh, the internet is run more like a telephone system than a publishing house. So publishers uh, get involved and they choose what can and can't happen. Whereas like a telephone system, you know, the telephone guys have no idea what's going on in their system. So they just let things go through. Um, the, the idea generally with, with the internet in the early days was that, um, you know, everyone had their own website running on their own uh, site and, and you didn't, your ISP didn't know what was going on and the hosting company didn't care. Um, but the idea now is, is that the likes of, especially YouTube um, is one that I'm aware of, that they get involved because now they control uh, algorithms. And if they like your YouTube video for certain reasons, which may or may not be a good thing, um, it, uh, they could drive it to the top of the list. And when people search for it, it'll pop up first. Um, it might be something that they recommend uh, based on other videos, etc. So the question there is: is that the i is is that YouTube in that case is starting to become more involved in the actual um, delivery of of the information, um, and they they you know they're, they're not totally uh, um, disinvolved or uninvolved in 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 the whole process. So um, a couple of things. Um, mm -hmm couple things. One, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, they're acting like a publisher, not a platform. Just ignore that. That's <laughs> wrong. That, that, that's not a meaningful decision. Um, that sure. language of publisher is sort of a thing that kind of got articulated as Section 230 ended up on the books and went through some of the earlier court cases, because a lot mm -hmm. of it was like putting fundamental First Amendment principles into sort of a more practically useful form by putting it into the statute. And there was some yep. courts were getting their head around it by understanding things in that concept. Um, okay. But there was never a, a role for neutrality. Um, I mean, like think of the bookstore, a bookstore, you know, to hold them liable for what is in one of the books they sell because they chose to sell it. Like it's a little easier to see that that's not cool. And so section 230 mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't, the, the algorithm and the recommendation engine is essentially kind of like choosing what books to stock in your bookstore, and it doesn't jeopardize the Section 230 protection at all. Um, and there was no rule about being neutral. Now, it sounds kind of counterintuitive because you're kind of <laughs> like, well, you're you're accentuating certain things and de-accentuating other things. But I use that phrase, and granted, it's my phrase, and courts haven't really used it, but I think it tends to boil down to this. In a case called Force v. Facebook, um, is actually a great case that talks about the algorithms and also what I'm about to say, which is that Section 230 makes the most sense when you focused on who imbued the content with its wrongful quality. Okay. Um, there's an earlier case called roommates.com and roommates.com focused on who created the content. But I think that that gets us part way, but I think it's more than who created it because a platform kind of has a somewhat symbiotic relationship and causing content to be created. And so people get confused and like, you created it, you created it. It's like saying Twitter helped create the tweets because they gave them the UI, the UI that said tweet this now. It has to be something more. Who prompted the thing that was wrongful or allegedly wrongful about the content? If it's the platform, then 230 doesn't apply. Like if it's their speech, if, if Twitter's, you know, Twitter supports on speech, Section yep. 230 doesn't apply it. They created the content and they imbued it with whatever potentially wrongful quality. But if it's somebody else's, it's somebody else's. And the fact that they might be accentuating it or not doesn't matter for a variety of reasons. But I think the easiest way to understand it is that's not what's making it potentially wrong. Whoever <laughs> made that speech potentially wrongful made it wrongful. And the fact that it might be showing up higher or lower in, in the display isn't changing that, that fact. Okay, I, I, I like that that, that bookshop analogy. That that really uh, explains explains it well. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. Actually, there aren't any more questions. Um, if anyone has a 
quick question, uh, shout out now or else um, it's 10 minutes to go. And I we'll never we talk about Section 230 again. This is your last chance to ever talk about <laughs> Section 230. I mean, I'm not even sure it's my last chance today. So, um. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's going to come up uh, more, more, uh, uh, very much more in in, yeah. in future. It's it, it's one even that that me from from Australia um, and and when I was in South Africa, I was I was aware of because of of just how important it is even across the world because uh, you know the world looks to the US to to define what's what how the internet works. Yeah, I mean, I would say to get back to that earlier thing, face palming is a perfectly appropriate response to a lot of the stuff, including the algorithm support. I don't quite get it. I don't think it helps. I wish they would stop. But I don't think there's a job for law here because of the First Amendment and because Section 230 is doing a really important job and getting rid of it is not going to make the platforms stop doing what's annoying you. It's just going to make them actually do more of what you'd hate. So that is the closing thought. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting, uh, very well explained. Um, I really enjoyed that. There were very many questions I had, but yeah, very explained through to me. Um, thank, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for having me. <laughs>